This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 21st, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we dive into the so-called glide path approach some have advocated for dealing with Alaska's current fiscal situation. Second, we explain why we believe Commonwealth North's new Alaska fiscal game misleads. And third, we outline what a recent Congressional Budget Office report tells us about where the federal fiscal situation is headed. And now, let's join Michael. We got three big uh, topics, and I want to jump into them first and foremost and get into it here right away. Uh, this, uh, this has been kind of floated around. We keep hearing about this idea of the glide path. And I know you tackled this on Facebook the other day, but let's talk about this glide path approach as number one, the, the one thing that they say, this is how we need to do it. Uh, we didn't get here in a day. We need to take this on. What say you on the glide path approach? Well, Michael, there has been a lot of discussion about the glide path. Uh, various candidates have talked about it. Uh, Donna talked about it. Uh, on the uh, show was that last week last week yep Um, and there's uh, some new uh, uh, information out from the permanent fund corporation at the end of august uh, beginning of september they published uh, a new set of projections uh, uh, over the next decade Uh, that's a useful way to analyze uh, the glide path so i uh, so i so i dug into it and we've got a post up on it on uh, the alaskans for sustainable budgets facebook page um, yesterday, basically, uh, the, the the approach I analyzed was um, uh, one that Roger Holland has talked about before, which is basically to reduce spending five percent per year um, until we get uh, spending and uh, uh, and revenues in balance. Um, and the and the piece of it that uh, I really hadn't dug into it before was using the earnings reserve account, uh, the balance of the earnings reserve account of the permanent fund to fund the deficits, because there are huge deficits uh, under that approach. I mean, if you don't, we're, we're $2.3 billion in, uh, uh, in, in deficit looking at uh, FY22, uh, and if um, and, and 5% a year knocks some of it off, but doesn't knock all of it off. And, and, um, and so you have to have some funding mechanism for, for that that deficit, and the one that some have suggested is the earnings reserve account. So, I, I dug in and um, and and took a look at that, um, and uh, some some observations out of it. This is something that I think we'll talk about uh, across a number of shows uh, the remainder of this fall before we get to the election. But um, a, a, f- a few observations out of that. One uh, is it takes a decade uh, to get uh, to get uh, uh, for the glide path to, to finally get uh, spending in line with. Uh, with deficits, um, by the time because of low oil prices and taking into account the statutory PFD, which the uh, the permanent funds new projections enable us to do, um, the updated numbers enable us to do, uh, the revenue spending doesn't come down to match revenues until uh, uh, 2030, so or 2029. So it's um, uh, it the glide we're, we're on the glide path for uh, for a, a long time and and the ultimate landing point is a three is a three billion dollar budget uh, in 2029 substantially below where uh, where we are now but it, they do balance uh, once you get out to, to 2029. Um, the second observation uh, 
uh, is that, uh, and, and and this is one that I think a lot of people have 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 argued about uh, without really looking at the numbers. Um, the second observation is that there is a, a, take using the the numbers in the new uh, permanent fund corporation projection. The uh, the earnings reserve account keeps refilling enough uh, to sort of keep its head above water, um, to have enough money in it to to to, to pay off these deficits uh, while you're on the glide path. Uh, now it's hugely dependent on having those 5% reductions per year. If you don't have those reductions per year, you do drain the earnings reserve account. But assuming that you have the 5% reductions per year, uh, the earnings reserve, according to the Permanent Fund Corporation's projections, and of course those are based on you know, outcomes in the, in the investment market and are certainly are not guaranteed to include the, uh, the usual footnote about investment outcomes, uh, but Based upon the, the, the Permanent Fund Corporation's projections, you do have enough money in the earnings reserve account uh, to pull this off. Now, a couple of things uh, on, the, on the other side that are important to, to focus on. One is you can't pay the, the inflation adjustment um, uh, in, 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 in most of the years uh, while you're on this glide path. You're using to use to have enough money in the earnings reserve to, to cover the deficit uh, through about the seventh year, uh, you, you are impairing, you can't pay the full um, uh, inflation adjustment. You can't pay any of the inflation adjustment like the first two years. Um, and then you are uh, continuing to eat into the inflation adjustment uh, during the subsequent years. We have to remember that currently the inflation adjustment is a statute just like the permanent fund uh, dividend statute, right. statute on the books. So, so to eat into the inflation adjustment, you have to either violate that statute or you have to change the statute. But, but assuming that you don't, assuming that you're using the money first and foremost to pay off the deficit and not, uh, not, to, not to pay off the inflation adjustment, uh, you've got enough money in the earnings reserve to do that, but, you don't, but the inflation adjustment uh, takes a hit. And I think then the, 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 the final thing about the numbers, before we get into the philosophy behind it, the final thing about the numbers is it comes at a significant hit to the, where the uh, uh, permanent fund balance is otherwise going to be. Uh, because you're taking money out of uh, the permanent fund or out of the earnings reserve that otherwise would go to the inflation adjustment, and because you're taking money out of the, out of the earnings reserve account, uh, that otherwise would stay in the earnings reserve account, be invested in produce earnings, uh, you're 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 reducing the value of the of the uh, of the permanent fund uh, balance over that period of time. And over the over the nine year period, again taking into account the projections made from the spring re the Department of Revenue spring forecast and from the permanent fund's most recent uh, projections over the uh, over the decade. Uh, you've reduced the permanent fund balance by somewhere in the neighborhood of $7.5 billion. So it, 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 if we weren't doing this, if we weren't using the ERA to, to, to pay off these deficits, uh, you would um, uh, have a, a roughly nearly an $80 billion, $78 billion uh, balance by the end of the decade uh, using the earnings reserve account, uh, balances in the earnings reserve account, not paying the full uh, inflation adjustment, you end up with about a seventy billion dollar uh, balance. Sure. That 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 has one impact um, uh, going forward. Uh, you that that loss in in balance uh, results in a loss in earnings. I mean, you don't have as much money invested. Right. And that loss in earnings is about four hundred million dollars a year going forward. So, so I'm going to dumb it down for myself here, just to kind of concise down what you said. So, essentially, there is enough money in the earnings reserve account if we make the cuts, the five percent cuts, because there's money continually going into it based on projections. Uh, but the overall impact would be to a reduction to the earning power of the overall fund because the ERA is actually part of the entire fund. Uh, and so it would mean in the long run we'd have a loss of $400 million a year in potential earnings that we could have because we'd be about $7.5, $8 billion shorter than we would be. But we could get through 
this dark period if we could get our spending under control. Am I am I catching all that pretty much right? You, you are. I, I, it's essentially what we're essentially doing is a tax on future generations. I mean, we're 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 using the earnings reserve account like we should have been using the CBR and the SBR the last decade. We're earning the we're using the earnings reserve account uh, uh, to to sort of uh, supplement or to subsidize uh, this generation uh, not having been able to get spending in control in the last decade and to subsidize it having an easier way of getting spending under control uh, this decade. Um, but that so this generation isn't really paying for it. We're taking it out of the out of essentially our kids' college fund. Um, and and the consequence is that future generations will pay for it uh, through lower PFDs because lower earnings mean lower PFDs in uh, in, in future years, uh, and they'll pay for it in terms of lower uh, uh, revenues coming out of the ER or coming out of the permanent fund to help support government. So they'll either they'll either suffer uh, in terms of lower government services, reduce government services, or they'll have to pay taxes to. To maintain the level of government services, it's, it's simply a way. It's it's a it's a it's a way of taxing future generations to pay for the problems that this generation has created. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. So I guess, Brad, what is the alternative? I mean, because again, we didn't get here in a single you know monumental leap. We incrementally got to this point of where the spending is out of control. Uh, what is your advocation, if not for utilizing a portion of the earnings reserve, because it is a tax on future generations, I'm not disagreeing with that, but what are the other options on the table and what's the philosophy behind it? Well, I, I've, we, we've talked about this a lot on the show. I'm an advocate of this generation paying its own way. I, I, think, I think it's, it's – it's, it's, I would use the word morally problematic, I guess – uh, for this generation who has enjoyed the good times, didn't get spending under control uh, the last decade, continued to use the CBR and the SBR to keep the good times going. Um, I spent a lot of time in Louisiana and in, in New Orleans, my youth, and so you know, laissez bon temps rouler, let's keep the good times going in the last decade. Um, and and now when you, now we're going to say, well, we're going to get it under control now, uh, but we're going to shift the costs. Uh, to future generations, I think that's just. I think that's that. That is that is problematic uh, to me. I think it's unfair uh, to future generations, uh, and and we're just essentially kicking the can down the road. The the alternative, uh, if you want to use the glide path uh, instead of instead of some other approach, the alternative is for this generation to uh, uh, to pay that in terms of taxes of some sort. Uh, contributions of some sort from this generation to pay to pay its own costs. And frankly, Michael, I think this generation paying it is is uh, is uh, at least a substantial part of it is is important from another aspect. We kept saying this last decade that we were on, that we were going to get on a glide path, that we were going to use the CBR and the SBR for what they were intended, which was to cushion the blow as we had to deal with uh, with reduced revenues. And we kept saying. That, that we were on a glide path. I mean, every year the legislature would say, we cut some this year. They really didn't. But we cut some this year, but we're going to cut more next year. We're going to cut more the year after that. We're going to get ourselves back in balance. Well, they never did. Um, and, and so I think this generation paying its own costs is important not only from the standpoint of being fair to future generations, but I think this generation paying its own costs <clears throat> Also, is is an important part of the enforcement mechanism to make sure that these five percent reductions or whatever the percent reductions are uh, are are followed through. Right. As long as this, as long as they, as long as the generation doesn't have to pay its own costs, as long as they can go to some some pot of money or some savings account uh, to pay for it, they'll talk a good game, but they'll never follow through because it doesn't hit them in the pocketbook. Um, and so, I think I think an important part of any glide path. Is, is to make sure that the current generation has to pay for the deficits they're running as they're on this glide path because then that engages them to, to, to ensure with their legislators that the legislators remain on the glide path because the current generation pays the cost if, if the legislators don't. Well, so it's, I, 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 think it's, I think it's critical uh, 
I think I think the alternative here is for the current generation to pay to pay these deficits, pay these costs as we're as we're on the glide path. And I think that's important also to to reinforcing the glide path. Well, and as a devil's advocate, I mean, playing the flip side of your position, I also believe that uh, I mean, my, my main worry here is that by taxing the current generation of Alaskans, we are also playing into that hand of giving the government and the politicians more money to play with and thereby giving them more road to kick the can down, which I, I'm also uh, I'm not a fan of and I'm seriously concerned about. It's one of the reasons why I'm still undecided on Proposition 1 because I'm afraid if we give them the more money, they will just take more time to, uh, you know, that the glide path will go from, you know, nine years in your projections to 15 or 20, which we know really even nine years is optimistic because we've never seen them really hold to a plan for longer than, you know, 18 or 24 months before they blow it up. Michael, I understand the point. My my response to that is we've demonstrated over the last decade if we don't hold the current generation's feet to the fire, uh, then it never happens. It's, everybody right. just talks a good game, but the reductions don't come. A uh, comment from Donna Ardwin, who's in the chat room. She says, uh, f- FYI, my suggestion on the show was to make big changes rather than small ones. And in order to take the time needed to implement the big changes, Instead of not, u- she said, not using the ERA, use unconstitutionally dedicated funds, the PCE and others. There's about $2 billion uh, tr- tied up in there. It would give us a little bit of breathing room, and I agree that that would be uh, also a more viable solution than the ERA. I looked at that, uh, and, uh, and this week, uh, Ledge Finance came out with their summary of appropriations for last year, uh, which includes the, the, the amounts of uh, those uh, uh, designated funds, uh, and it's about a billion and a half. PCE and the, and the college fund are the two biggest parts of that. Uh, the total, according to Ledge Finance, is about a billion and a half. That would take care of 75 percent, just 75 percent of the first year's deficit of the FY22 deficit, and then they would be gone. Uh, and we'd have the issue then of how we fund the programs uh, that those designated uh, uh, that those designated funds uh, deal with. It, it is a way to offset a portion of the first year's uh, deficit, but it certainly doesn't uh, uh, certainly doesn't meet the, the 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 full deficit anywhere near the full deficit of the glide path. And yeah, you can make bigger changes. Uh, instead of five percent, uh, you can you can do two ten uh, percent. But I, <laughs> the credibility of five percent uh, to me is 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 sketchy. If you start saying, "Well, we're going to do bigger." bigger reductions we just get we just go right back in unless the current generation is paying for it we just go right back into the last decade where uh, everybody talked a good game but nobody did anything why is brad calling those funds designated designated dedicated i mean the the constitution doesn't allow for dedicated funds but designated is a slightly different term and that's what the you know, or the other way around. I mean, I can never even remember. They're basically, I mean, it's basically money that should not be held in a single account uh, and and dedicated to a single purpose, which is what the Constitution uh, tried to do, but the <laughs> legislators figured out a way to work around that. Yeah, I always chuckle about that. I mean, the, 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 the PFD is a designated fund. I mean, it should be a designated fund. The, the Natasha changed it in 2017. Uh, in order to uh, in order to make it seem like unre- unrestricted general funds, uh, but designated funds are those funds that are designated by statute for a certain purpose. Yes, the Supreme Court's told us that that the uh, that the legislature can come in and override that in any given year through appropriations bills. But there are statutes on the books, like for the PFD, uh, that says those funds those funds should be used for uh, for a certain purpose. Um, and what they are uh, are essentially funded. They're like Social Security in a way. It's like the Social Security Trust Fund. They're funds that are built up, put into a separate account that supports certain programs. If you took away the Social Security Trust Fund, then then you would have to fund Social Security uh, out of the out of the general fund, out of the U.S. general fund. Uh, just like it, the program doesn't go away, Social Security is still there, Medicare is still there. Medicaid's still there. You you would you would you would just have to fund it out of the out of the general fund, and that's the, sort of the same way with these designated funds, the DGF funds. Uh, they are set aside and they're funding specific programs. If you if you if you monetize the fund in the, the monetize the amount in the fund, uh, then the program doesn't go away. You still got to pay for the program. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we are uh, continuing on here. Uh, T. Shan asks, why is Brad calling for those funds? No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, let me go back. The other T. Uh, the other question she asked, why doesn't Brad Keithley discuss how to lower operating costs of government? I have to make a quick phone call here, Brad, for a technical issue, so you can answer that and run on if you need to. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Brad Keithley has since twenty since 2012. If you go back and read the Anchorage Daily News uh, op- op-ed uh, uh, page in October of 2012, you'll find a column from Brad Keithley saying, uh, the game's come to an end. Uh, we can't pay for government going forward. We need to start reducing uh, operating costs uh, and uh, and outlining uh, ways to do that. Uh, uh, take care of, uh, re- uh, reduce, eliminate optional Medicaid, Medi- Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare uh, programs, reduce university funding, uh, re- start reining in uh, the BSA, uh, and uh, and bringing down the cost of K through 12. I I talked about I've talked about that for a decade. Right. Um, and uh, and 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 no one paid attention. So yeah, I can continue talking about it, but 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 we are where we are, and where we are is with a huge deficit. And and the five percent reductions, the five the the glide path is going to require that we implement uh, uh, those reductions uh, as as we go. Um, and 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 take those steps that I've talked about for the last decade uh, as as we go, but we've got to face up to the fact that we've got these huge deficits uh, and deal with how to fund. Uh, uh, if we are going to go on a glide path uh, again, uh, deal with how we're going to fund those deficits. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, I understand why Brad has moved away from talking specifically about some of the cuts because. Uh, for those of you who've been listening to the program for a long time, we've been talking about that for six years. Uh, we've talking about specific cuts, and unfortunately, past performance it seems to be indicative of future results. Right? I mean, that's what's going on right now. I mean, we 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 see that there has been no political will to do it. I'm not going to stop talking about it, but it is uh, it is a big it is a big problem. Uh, because we just have not had people in there with the political will to do something. And we've got to hold these people's feet to the fire. I'm hoping that this election cycle is a change, Brad, that will bring some of that about. Yep, I, I agree, Michael. But but we've got a $2.3 billion deficit. I mean, 50% of next of the FY22 budget uh, is, in, is in deficit. And yes, there are ideas on how to cut spending, and and we're going to be continue talking about them this coming decade in order to achieve uh, even the glide path uh, reductions. Uh, but you know, unless somebody's going to come in and say, and keep in mind that Governor Dunleavy's 2019 uh, proposed deficit reduction was only a billion dollars. It was a billion dollars. I mean, that's a big number, but it was only a billion dollars, and we've got a 2.3 billion dollar. Uh, deficit. Governor Dunleavy's 2019 proposals wouldn't even get us halfway uh, to, to the to the deficits that we're facing uh, next year. So we can talk around about uh, uh, operating cost reductions. I've continued to talk about them, continue to talk about them in the way I have uh, the last decade. We just finished up with a discussion of the glide path. Number two is Alaska's budget choices. Now, Commonwealth North Brad wrote a piece out there which uh, you say misleads us because there are multiple approaches multiple choices we talked about a few with donna ardwin last week you and i have talked about a couple different ones as well you just espoused uh, some ideas on one give us you give us uh, you know show us where the commonwealth north piece runs awry here well it's 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 not a piece it's a it's a tool the commonwealth north has created uh for closing the alaska budget gap uh governor uh walker did one of these back in 2015 2016 uh, uh, as as a tool that would allow citizens to go in and and make choices among various uh, alternatives for for how to how to deal with the budget uh, and Commonwealth North I, I will give them credit in this regard Commonwealth North came forward with a tool uh, that that some are pushing as as a test for candidates uh, as well as citizens for candidates to be able to, to demonstrate how they would uh, would would close the budget gap and and it's sort of spreading. I got an email from the Resource Defense Council, and I'm sure if I go back into my spam filter, there's one from the Alaska Chamber uh, that would say, "Here's the tool that we need to be using uh, during this election cycle uh, for for both uh, uh, making uh, 
making choices about how we would close the, the budget gap as well as evaluating candidates' choices for how, uh, how they close the budget gap. Here's, here, here's the fundamental problem, though, uh, with, uh, with the Commonwealth North uh, tool. Y you need a starting point for any of these games and there's a lot at the federal level, too. You need a starting point for any of these games, these budget games, on how you close, uh, close the budget gap. And the starting point's important. Um, uh, the starting point sort of says, this is where you are, and now you need to make choices going forward uh, in order to get uh, the budget uh, in balance. Um, the starting point that, that the, the U.S. Uh, Congressional Budget Office sort of the the, the truly nonpartisan budget office that sits at the at the federal level that looks at these looks at these issues and that groups like uh, the, the the committee for a responsible federal budget and the Concord Coalition uh, look at uh, the games they have all start with current law and they say this is the budget under current law uh, and now you need to make changes to current law uh, in order to close the budget gap and that that's valuable because you see the path we're on under current law, and you see the changes that need to be made to current law, you, uh, you are able to, to capture and sort of visualize the changes to be made uh, under current law to, uh, to, to get to a solution. Commonwealth North doesn't do that. Commonwealth North starts at the budget gap that we had last year uh, and then sort of sets that as the baseline. The problem with that is the budget last year had a huge cut in the PFD. Um, and so they're, they're incorporating, their starting point incorporates already a huge cut uh, in the PFD. The, the deficit, the FY22 deficit that we talk about, the current law deficit that we're facing next year is $2.3 billion. The starting point, the deficit that, co that the Commonwealth North game says you need to look at is $1.3 billion. Uh, that, that difference, that billion-dollar difference is the PFD. The amount that was cut out of the uh, out of the PFD. Right. So when you play the Commonwealth North game, you say, "Well, I've got to close a 1.3 billion dollar deficit, um, and so um, here's what I would do to do that. Uh, I would make spending cuts, or I would make revenue adjustments uh, to close that 1.3 billion dollars. And then, in, and at the end, you go, "Well, I'm done. I've got 1.3 billion dollars. The problem is, you just baked in a billion dollar cut to the statutory PFD." Uh, as part of that process, it does it doesn't help the game be, by 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 not having the right starting point, by not having the current law starting point. The game doesn't really give Alaskans an understanding of our true deficit picture. It's it's they're they're baking in they're assuming a billion dollar close uh, in in the PFD uh, from uh, from the start. The one of the one of the game's creators said, well, but you could, there's an option in there to, to go back to a statutory deficit and to build the, build the deficit back. Yeah, but the game doesn't, the game doesn't lead you to do that. The game, the game is trying to direct you to close $1.3 billion. There's a little, there's a little uh, 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 red box at the bottom that's constantly updating as you're making choices that's based off $1.3 billion. And, and you, you certainly, I mean, the game's not built for you to add to that deficit, the game's built for you to, to close that deficit. So it, 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 it's, a, it's just misleading in both Alaskans, and it's unfair to candidates uh, uh, to, uh, to, to use that game as the basis for, uh, as the basis for your evaluation because you're pre-baking um, uh, in, in a billion-dollar cut in the PFD from the, from the get-go. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, we got about three minutes here if you want to try and tack into number three. The current and long-term fiscal situation with the Fed is not uh, great. Oh, the, there, there's been some some recent reports coming out of uh, out of CBO, which is a, 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 a is a very good source for information on the federal budget, uh, both uh, near term over the next day next decade. And yesterday they released their long-term forecast, which is over the next uh, 30 years, both of which show federal debt uh, blowing out of control. A little bit of a plug: we're having a program we're co-sponsoring with the Concord Coalition, one of the one of the best uh, 
uh, federal budget hawk programs, budget watch programs. We're co-sponsoring a, a, a session at noon, a 45 minute session, 45 minute session at noon, where one of the Concord Coalition, the national policy director of the Concord Coalition, is going to give an update, federal federal fiscal update, which will sort of put all of these issues in context. So for those of you who are interested in federal fiscal issues, please join us at noon. You can find out how to do that on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. I think it's going to be an excellent summary of the of the federal fiscal situation that we're facing, and it's frightening. I mean, it's, it's a, we think we got a difficult situation at the state level. The situation that we have built at the federal level is frightening in terms of the amount of uh, and the amount of debt we're uh, we're taking on and the and the direction in which our federal fiscal situation is headed. And there's no stopping. I mean, they, these people just there is no slowing it down. They uh, they they just seem to be oblivious to the basic facts of arithmetic, um, which is just again terrifying. It it is. I mean, the 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 thirty year projection now says, and this is this is the good case. This is the current law case. This, this is this is this incorporates uh, 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 social security cuts in the 2030s when the when the fund runs dry and we can only fund it fi- from current projections, and it projects we're at 195 percent of GDP uh, debt is at 195 percent of GDP, double the, the amount of our GDP by 2050. Anything else you want to add? We got about three minutes here. Well, Michael, I. I for those who are truly interested in f- federal fiscal issues, I really do encourage you to join us uh, for uh, for this online uh, discussion we're going to have at noon with uh, Tori Gorman, who's the uh, national policy director of the uh, uh, of the Concord Coalition. There's so much going on in D.C. right now. We the budget runs out, the appropriations run out at the end of this month in nine days, eight days now. Uh, uh, the federal government is 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 headed toward a shutdown if. Uh, if we don't get uh, continuing appropriations in place or continuing resolution in place. And there's a lot of controversy about that right now. We may be facing a federal gov- government shutdown uh, on, the, on the eve of, of, the, uh, of the election. Um, the, 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 the deficit outlook over the next decade, uh, in part because of COVID, uh, but we were headed there anyway. We're headed toward, I mean, we used to think 500, a $500 billion deficit was a huge thing. Well, we passed a trillion dollars. Uh, uh, we were headed toward passing a trillion dollars uh, uh, this year, uh, with COVID and the and the changes that's made uh, to the economic outlook. We're now headed toward two trillion dollar uh, deficits by the end of this decade. And then uh, at the end of the of the thirty year look that uh, CBO just did, as I said, we're headed toward a budget deficit that is that sets records in terms of its relationship to GDP, uh, in terms of its uh, of the percent of GDP that we're running uh, as a as a deficit uh, each year, the percent of the budget that's being paid for uh, uh, through through the issuance of additional debt, and it's all hanging. Uh, the, the, those who say don't worry about it, we're fine. It's all hand hanging by a very slender slender thread of interest costs. They're assuming interest costs stay at low levels like forever so that the interest expense that you're that you're having to deal with as part of the annual budget stays relatively, relatively uh, uh, muted. If interest costs, I mean, we're at interest costs of less than 1% now, but if interest costs go to 2%, if they go back to 3%, 4%, 5%, uh, the historical norms, the, bu- the federal budget explodes and the federal deficit explodes. And, and there are people, very good people, very calm people, who are talking about you know the credibility of the dollar at that point. So the the, the federal issues we're facing, uh, even even by the end of this month, not to mention you know the the ten year cycle and the and the thirty year cycle, the federal budget the federal budget issues we're facing are huge uh, and hugely consequential to the to the to the economic underpinning of the country. So. For those who are interested in learning more about that and understanding more about that, I would encourage you to join us at noon uh, for this uh, the, for this online session with Tori. We'll have it available after that, but uh, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions at noon uh, with Tori. And again, you can find the link for that by going to the Alaskans for uh, Sustainable Budgets uh, Facebook page and uh, and and joining us either on Zoom. Uh, if you want to be in the in the room to to be able to ask questions, or we're going to broadcast it also on Facebook Live 
both on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets page as well as the Concord Coalition page. All right. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, thanks for coming on board. Uh, good discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, see what uh, what uh, comes out of it maybe next week. Thank you for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.